The Food Service Exchange presents. Um, for those of you that do not know me, I'm Erica Motes. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for Ollie Refrigeration Division North America, which consists of both the Beverage Air and Victory brands. I want to personally thank all of you for joining us today. Our goal with Culinary Conversations is to take a deeper look into the trends in the food service industry. Today, we will focus on health, the healthcare segment with a Q&A with our esteemed panelists, Jill Martin and Dan Henroyd. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about Jill and Dan um, and what they've been doing um, in their careers and as well as during the pandemic. Jill Martin's the Director of Food and Nutrition Services for the UC San Diego Health System. Jill has been working for the Nutrition Services Department at UCSD Health since 2011. She's held a variety of positions within the organization and was reported promoted to director in late 2019. She oversees the operations of two hospitals with a total of 803 licensed beds. Jill has been a member of the San Diego Nutrition and Health Leadership Team since 2011 and is currently the co-chair. During her time with UCSD Health, she's opened multiple new concepts. In addition, she helped plan and implement the new room service operations, which resulted in a higher patient satisfaction score. Dan Henroyd, the Director of Department of Nutrition and Food Services at the University of California, San Francisco Health System is joining us as well. Dan has vast responsibilities within the system, including patient meal services at three hospitals, totaling 817 beds, seven retail food operations, catering conference services, three gift shops, in addition to oversight of inpatient and outpatient nutrition services. He's led the creation or renovation of all retail food outlets at UCSF. Dan oversees other non-traditional programs such as digital signage, an interactive patient experience system, and a fleet of 33 robots, which is pretty cool. I hope he tells us about that. In addition to these responsibilities, Dan serves as a health system sustainability officer. Dan and his team have remained very busy throughout the pandemic. They're opening a hospital, building a new kitchen, planning for two new hospitals, and a medical office building. Amidst all of this, they still had time to construct several, several drive-through testing clinics and launch a mobile ordering solution. Um, both of our panelists are very, very, have very impressive backgrounds and have been very active in the healthcare system, so we're very lucky to have them. I'd also like to introduce you to Liz Jenneru. She's our Western Re Regional Manager and Healthcare Specialist. She's going to be our panelist, uh, our moderator for this Q&A discussion. Um, Liz has worked in the food service industry for over 25 years. We're very lucky to have her here at Ollie Refrigeration because she has a vast amount of experience as an operator after graduating from California State University Long Beach with a degree in food nutrition. Liz's first job was a patient services manager at LAC slash USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. She continued to pursue a career in health healthcare food service management for many years before beginning her sales career in the food service industry. Prior to joining us at the Ollie Refrigeration team, Liz held regional sales positions at Dynex and Lakeside Manufacturing, where she led the sales efforts in healthcare and senior living segments. We're very excited um, to have all of you as a guest, and I'm going to hand this over to Liz so we can begin. Hello all, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. We have two great panelists for our discussion. I've known Dan and Joe for many years, but when I heard the bio read today, I was amazed all over again by their accomplishments, their passion, and the great work that they do every single day to serve their organizations and the community that they work in. Dan and Joe work for two of the most progressive hospital systems in the country, UC San Francisco Health and UC San Diego Health. They're both well known for their innovative patient care and advanced technologies. Case in point, when you heard Ryan mention that Dan manages a fleet of robots, all 33 of them, in addition to humans, of course, as the robots deliver meals to the patients. Dan's operation is truly one of a kind. But what's more amazing is that Dan didn't start his robot operation this year during COVID, like a lot of other companies have, or at least they are testing them. Dan actually started his robot operation five years ago when very few people knew the benefits of using robots for patient care or meal delivery or any other things. 
and Jill at UC San Diego Health. As Ryan mentioned, she improved patient satisfaction score by tenfold. They were in the ninth percentile and they are in the 90, mid 90s today. And she also decreased plate waste from 40% to 5%. What a great accomplishment. Just with better menu offers in her room service program. So it's an honor to have Joe and Dan with us today. I know we'll enjoy our conversation together. With that, let's get started with our panel discussion. Our panel discussion will cover two key topics. The first one is the pandemic and you go, oh no, I don't wanna hear a thing more about the pandemic. I'm so sick of it and we are in the thick of it again. But let's hear what these operators have to say. Let them tell us what's happening in food service management in hospitals during the pandemic from the beginning to now. The second topic is future trends. What do these operators have to say about upcoming trends? Or are they part of creating new ones? So let's begin with the first topic. Joe and Dan, please unmute yourself. All righty then. So um, the first topic is the pandemic. And I have this first question, it will be asked to both of you. What was the state of business like before COVID? Um, why don't you go first, Joe? All right, thanks, Liz. So for us, and I, I imagine it was similar for Dan as well, um, we were at capacity. Our EDs were overflowing. Uh, we had just opened a new hospital about four years ago, and we were already full. Um, so we were looking for places to put patients. Uh, we certainly weren't struggling for business. Uh, our retail sales were increasing year over year by about 5 to 10% and always looking for new opportunities for retail, making sure that we're meeting our, our customers' needs, um, more staff coming on board. We had just opened a new outpatient pavilion uh, about two years ago or three years ago now. Um, so we were uh, increasing our patient capacity there as well. And we were in the beginning stages of planning for a new hospital that will be opening in our Hillcrest location uh, that was originally planned to open about 2030. It looks like that's going to be pushed back a little bit now uh, due to COVID and some of the changes in our requirements. Um, and we're also in the planning stages for a new outpatient pavilion in the Hillcrest location as well, which should open within the next three years. Um, but of course, we saw a huge change in all of that with COVID and uh, our retail went down quite a bit. Um, obviously we canceled a lot of elective procedures and tried to manage our, our patient flow for a little while, um, but big changes, but, uh, hopefully we'll get back there <laughs> soon enough. Yeah, it was basically the same for us. Uh, you know, we got down as low as 50% less retail volume. We've climbed it back up to about uh, 30%, um, below prior, prior months, uh, last year. Um, I think the bigger thing for us was not only do, do all the decreased volumes, we had a very large catering department. We were doing about three and a half million uh, dollars a year. And so with the just decreases in the number of staff, uh, budget cuts, they basically have said no, no more catering. We had to take a three and a half million dollar business and unionize work environment and bring it down to close to zero. Um, so that's been a huge you know, challenge for us. And then it was mentioned in the intro uh, when we started the pandemic, we had two hospital campuses. Uh, five years ago, when we opened our Mission Bay campus, we closed out Mount Zion, and then the decision was made to reopen the Mount Zion campus during the pandemic, um, but it didn't have a kitchen. It had a cafe, but no kitchen. So we're in the process of reconstituting the kitchen. Uh, it, it's about 80% done, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to getting that up and running next year. But to do all that uh, under emergency order uh, is certainly a lot of work. Well, um, yeah, so I, we all know that business was booming everywhere, including hospitals, expansion and all that. So that came to a halt. And I heard that both of you also had um, the first COVID patients in your hospitals. So um, the next question would be, what adjustments and operating changes 
you have to make during the pandemic? Um, this question will be for you, Dan. So I think first and foremost is really about the the, the safety and, and perceived risk and safety of our team. So we, we had some of the first plastic uh, barriers up uh, at our cashier stations. We just did it, didn't ask for permission and anything like that. We did many of the other same things that were have been mandated across the country in terms of uh, no self-service and making a lot of those uh, adjustments. I mean, certainly we're using a, a crazy amount of packaged uh, food products. Uh, in addition, uh, we had to flex certain stations, close them down, re-envision them to support more of a served uh, environment. Um, you know, soup would be a good example. So um, really a lot of staffing uh, adjustments, but but the idea that, you know, people are in fact uh, feeling safe. Um, our dining room capacity is a fraction of what it was. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, visual indicators to let people know where they can and can't sit. Um, in San Francisco, we were exempted from some of the public health orders that impacted the restaurants to basically no indoor dining and stuff like that. So we, we've been doing this for quite some time. And as you mentioned at the beginning, we had our first COVID cases in February. We got some of the cruise ships. So we had a little bit of a jump start on, on certain things uh, compared to maybe some of my colleagues. Thanks, Dan. Um, this question is asked to Jill. What are some of the challenges that you had to overcome during this time? I think one of the biggest challenges that we had was just the amount of information that was out in the world and being shared with our staff. Uh, we were really concerned about making sure that our staff were getting the right information, that they felt comfortable being able to come to work, that they were going to be protected. Um, Similar to what Dan said, we had some of the first patients that actually came from Wuhan um, in early February. So at the time that we were getting those patients, there wasn't a lot of uh, historical information out there. And so we were trying to figure that out within the health system. You know, what is this going to look like? What type of precautions do we need to take? What changes do we need to make? And then you have you know, our staff who are probably you know, not as educated as some of the other you know, medical professionals that we have. And so they're getting their information from news sources, uh, from social media, from anywhere uh, that might not have the information that they need to have and then possibly not the correct information. So we spent a lot of time just trying to work with our staff. We would meet with them twice daily, uh, let them know what information we had, keep them up to date, let them know that their safety is our number one priority. Uh, we'll make sure that they're uh, taken care of as far as child care issues that started to come into play a little bit further down the road when schools were closing and our staff don't have the ability to provide uh, paid child care uh, like some of our nurses and physicians do. Um, so that was definitely a concern. And so we just spent a lot of time working with them and trying to make sure that they were still able to come to work, um, make money, support their families. And once the staff were taken care of, then we started to focus more operationally on, you know, our retail sales went down by 50% and how are we going to get that back or what are, what changes are we going to make? Um, similar to Dan, we canceled all catering. Um, we had to move staff around cross train. So just a lot of, uh, a lot of staff involvement that was needed at the time. Yeah, I, I bet you it was extremely challenging because I remember in the beginning, um, in March and April, when you turn on the television or um, the radio, whatever, it's all about the hospitals. The scenes were horrible and they were talking about healthcare workers getting COVID, doctors getting COVID, nurses getting COVID, and then some die. And I just, you know, Imagine you had to overcome that fear in your employees to make sure they feel good about coming to work. And nobody probably could have felt good about coming to work, but you know, you had to be the leader to actually take the fear away, lead them out of fear and lead them into action. So we really appreciate hearing that. Um, so the next question is for Dan. Any equipment changes you had to make or add or eliminate um, due to the operational changes for COVID? 
We didn't have to make a, a ton of changes. Uh, I think we were focused a lot more on what I'll call quick fire equipment, um, panini presses and things like that, that allow uh, you to do something else while it's in fact being cooked. Um, that's sort of a key fundamental part of a lot of our designs is we want flexibility. Uh, we have stations where we have quick connect equipment where we can swap out you know, saute ranges for walks and things like that and sort of re-envision uh, the concept that that comes with that. And we had built some flexibility into, you know, our, our stations to be able to do a, a lot of different things. And I think that's a lot, a lot where we're at right now. Um, we, we, are, we are still trying to make sure that um, em, employees have a reason to come and, and patronize us. Uh, what we're seeing is that the, the residual effect on unemployment, so now all of a sudden maybe a two household income is now down to one uh, income, so people are not patronizing us perhaps as much as they used to. And because a lot of the external uh, groups, in our cases, uh, we're a graduate health sciences university too. We had a lot of students who are not on campus right now that are not here. We had substantial restrictions on visitors, and we still do. And so those people are not on campus, uh, you know, either. So, so now we're trying to look at ways to capture sales that um, are, are not perhaps how we did it before. And a lot of what we're trying to do is how can we go all the way to the customer instead of always having them come to us, how can we you know, go to them? And in fact, we, we launched a destination delivery program on Monday that we're getting up off the ground where basically they're able to pre-order, prepay, and then we will deliver to them and we'll deliver to selected destinations rather than letting it be you know, a, a free for all. Um, we're certainly interested in some packaging innovations, any types of equipment that can help us do sort of single serve packaging. Um, and, and we're always looking for compostable for options for that as well. Thank you, Dan. Um, Joe, this question is for you. How does technology play in the new way of operating? Well, uh, technology has been a big part of, you know, the changes that we've made since COVID started. Uh, for our department, we were able to increase the use of our order ahead app. So we had launched this previously in our La Jolla location and uh, there was some use of it, but with COVID it increased exponentially and we were able to launch that at our Hillcrest location as well. Uh, after launching it and having it available in both locations, we saw our sales in that area increase uh, about three times what it had been. Uh, which is really good considering that our, our the rest of our retail was down quite a bit. So we found that people were just more, much more comfortable with being able to order their food, pay for it, uh, just come down, pick it up, and, and go back to whether it's their break room or their office and not have to stand in line in the cafe where there would be other people. Yes, they would be socially distanced, but just eliminating any additional exposure that was potential there. So um, that's been a big, a big piece that um, played a big role for us. We also, you know, our, our dietitians have been able to use telehealth for seeing outpatients. Um, that's been helpful. They've also been able to do some charting from home and not needing to uh, be in the office with maybe, you know, 10 or 12 other dietitians in the same office. So we've been able to monitor that a little bit more. And, um, for, for the health system, we launched a self-screening app. So all of our staff, before coming to work, fill out a self-screening. It allows them to know whether their symptoms or if they have symptoms, they shouldn't be coming to work. So it stops that process before they actually get in the hospital. Um, it actually notifies our employee health if they do have symptoms and someone from employee health reaches out to them and we'll start the process of possibly testing or talking about what, what steps they need to take moving forward. Uh, and just every person then coming in the hospital or at least every staff member is being screened ahead of time. So we're eliminating what could be additional exposure at work. And I think probably one of the most exciting things, um, quite recently we launched a California Notify um, setting on your phone, and this was launched only at UCSF and UCSC, where patients who are UCSF or UCSC patients, um, if they do test positive, uh, 
there's a notification that would go out to anyone else who has the setting on their phone, letting them know that they have been near someone who tested positive and gives them an opportunity to get tested or at least, you know, stay away from others during that time and um, make sure that they're helping to prevent the spread. So that did launch between the two of us, but I actually just found out this morning that they've added it to five additional UCs. So now they'll have that option as well. So hopefully we'll start to see this spread throughout the rest of the state and you know maybe the rest of the country. Oh, that's very impressive. Thank you. So the last question in this segment um, will be asked to both you, Dan and Jill. Um, what are you most proud of out of this unprecedented experience. Dan. I think the resiliency of our, our, our team, uh, you know, the fact that they were able to help work with us to change, you know, we are in a, a unionized environment. Sometimes those environments are not the easiest to make changes in. Um, I think the other part is it just made us better managers. We really had to be much better listeners. So when we look at the impact uh, of COVID-19 on populations and the disproportionate impact on certain populations compared to others. A lot of our employees fall into those buckets. So we really had to listen much better and, and do things like um, worry about how they're going to not want to take public transportation. And oh, by the way, public transportation may be cut back substantially on their routes. So now all of a sudden we're having to work with them to find ways uh, to come to work. Uh, we've tried to still continue to be innovative. We created a, a, a grocery store, which we call pop-up provisions, where basically, you know, that, that we've evolved over time during the pandemic. So early on, everybody was baking and all-purpose flour was really hard to come by. And so we've, we put that in so people wouldn't have to make another trip to the grocery store uh, because they were concerned about, you know, going out and uh, doing some of that. And then I think just the ability to more rapidly synthesize uh, and data and make decisions. So I can go onto a dashboard right now. I know precisely how many patients are in our organization, where they're at, how many are invented, how many are not. I can see where the, the COVID cases are in fact coming from. Um, but it also highlighted the fact that sometimes we develop programs in, in healthcare food service that take quite a while to do that. I mean, it's really tough in a California hospital because we've got to worry about seismic rules and regs too. Um, but we were able to make changes really fast. And so it's now sort of challenged our mindset and our thinking to say, you know, a program that might have taken us, you know, three, four, five months to do through too many meetings and, and decision-making processes, we can just do it, innovate and be rapid about it and then change on a dime. So a um, little bit of a long answer, but that's what I'm most proud of. Well said, Dan. Um, I think we previously chatted, um, what was the record of uh, the X sales you you selling eggs in your grocery store in the hospital? Raw raw eggs, uh, cage free local eggs are my top seller in my grocery store now. We weren't selling them at the beginning, uh, but we are. That is my top seller right now, hands down. That's crazy. And Miss Jill, what are you most proud of? So I think for us, I the uh, ability to be resourceful. Um, all of our staff really stepped up to look at ways that we were doing things and try and modify them to meet the needs of the situation that we were in. Um, we were no longer able to have the salad bar where it's self-service. So we took that and we put it on our order ahead app. So customers could still order a salad uh, made to order based on what they would prefer. And not have to just take whatever pre-made salad is available in the cafe. So that was something, you know, we were looking at what can we do to still offer the same things that our customers really like and not have to you know, add additional staffing for it or um, serve it in a different type of way. We also, we had closed down our coffee cart recently. And so, um, we didn't really have any options outside of the hospital that were available for either visitors who are waiting because we have a similar strict uh, visitor policy. So we don't have a lot of people that are able to come in the hospital and get food, but they might be at our outpatient pavilion or at our cancer center or other places where they just don't have food available. So we repurposed an old cafe that we had shut down. Uh, we reopened it using a lot of the equipment that we already had. We changed the menu around and basically provided another option for, for family members, visitors, and even other um, 
staff that were working in office buildings outside of the hospital that would still have something where they could go and get some food, um, not have to travel too far, or go through the screening process to come into the hospital. Uh, we also opened some uh, grocery areas in both of our cafes, so staff could pick up items there instead of having to go to the grocery store, um, just really save that trip and that additional exposure of them going to the store. We offered um, family meals, so pre-made family meals that they could order ahead and come pick up and take home. So we had stir fry bowls and salads and pastas and pizzas and things like that, other options that they could uh, choose from. And then I think probably the most um, rewarding uh, resource that we used when we had a couple of the first patients from Wuhan, uh, Wuhan um, they only spoke Mandarin. And we were really struggling with getting them the food to eat that they that they enjoyed. They didn't really want to use the interpreter service that we have. Um, so we have a cook who was working at our other location who spoke Mandarin. And we brought him down to the location where these patients were. And he would speak with them on the phone every day, uh, check in on them, see how they were doing, prepare meals specifically for them. And it just made a world of difference. And so... Just our staff's willingness to you know, take that extra step was, was very meaningful for us. Thanks, Jill and Dan. Um, we're certainly very proud of you guys in your profession, uh, serving the patients and delivering uh, patient meals and keeping the patients, the doctors and nurses and the staff, the first responders, well fed so that they can do the job of saving lives. So thank you, applause to you guys. Um, before we go into the next segment, I uh, wanted the audience to have a chance to type in questions in the chat box and Mitch is uh, monitoring it and Ryan would read out the questions at the end after our second segment. So please feel free to ask questions to our panelists. All right, so we are going to talk about future trends a little bit. Um, ben, how do you see healthcare food service evolve in the next three, five years or beyond? So I think a lot of that resourcefulness and innovation uh, will, will absolutely continue. I, I see our uh, pre-order pickup and potentially some of our delivery programs staying in place over time. Uh, we're actively looking at food lockers uh, to extend some of our, our options at certain times of day and certain campuses uh, as well. Um, I think that the, the need to be uh, versatile and uh, still look at your concepts and make them flex uh, as much as possible. I still think there's going to be a push to do you know, more on demand. Uh, I do think that robotics will still uh, continue to play. Uh, we actually had it um, already on the, in the works, but we're getting a ramen robot. Um, to be added to one of our campuses as a trial. Um, makes a pretty good ramen because we, we, we know our ramen here in Northern California. So uh, we're not just gonna accept anything that comes through. Um, so we're looking at, at, at some other options there. Uh, we did consider uh, you know, other robots that are on the market. Um, again, at the time, pre-pandemic, the, the use case wasn't there, but I think we're gonna really substantively rethink that. I think one of the lessons learned is that it, people need to eat with their eyes. We actually tried virtualizing our kitchens at our dinner at our at, at two of our cafes that had dinner service. And in one location, it worked really well. And, and one location, it didn't. And the big difference between the two was people being able to eat and shop with their eyes. And so the, the ability to make that very strong first impression uh, to customers one way or the other, and then how do you do that in a virtual environment through apps through other things to sort of sell that you're you're supposed to be um, you're doing it so I think we'll still be continue to look at you know how we're able to use that precious labor uh, that, that we do have and and maximize it through providing more on-demand type type programs overall a couple of years ago I follow one of Dan's robots in his hospital it was pretty fun <laughs> Um, thank you, Dan. Um, Jill, trends are on the horizon. Uh, what do you see? And also, um, is there any changes that you foresee um, in room service programming? I don't, I don't really see room service going away or going anywhere. There may be some changes that come with it, um, including some technology. So maybe more use of a patient app or 
um, just an option for patients to order in their room and not require someone to take a phone call or come take an order in person. Uh, I do think that that will continue to grow. Um, but I don't think we'll ever get away from what room service provides and that, that human contact and connection that our staff will provide for our patients. Um, something that we always hear from our patients is the, the staff that go into the rooms to take their orders or to bring them their food or the ones they look forward to the most. They're not there to draw blood or you know, do some sort of procedure on them. They are there to provide them with nourishment and comfort. And uh, that's something that they might not get a lot of. So you might not have as many visitors that are able to come see you. Or in our current situation, they might not have any visitors that are able to come visit them. So they really rely on that, that human connection with the staff that we provide. Um, I do also think there will be a focus on um, more sustainability, uh, lifestyle and healing, uh, more holistic, looking at food as medicine, um, possible meal prescriptions, and um, just kind of focusing on overall lifestyle health and changes. And um, with, of course, the involvement of technology where it can play a part as well. Um, but yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of innovation on, on particularly on the, the patient meal acquisition. So the, the, you know, when you're in a hotel and you order uh, a meal, it's usually like one meal a day or something like that. Now, if you had to do that multiple times a day, it gets a bit tedious. So we've actually been able to put in a system at one of our hospitals where the, the meal selections are presented to them, um, is presented to them into the language they're likely to speak. Uh, we've translated menus into eight different languages, but I think we're going to start moving more into per people's personal devices and still trying to provide that same robust uh, dining experience. I, I also think there's going to be more and more convergence between front of the house and back of the house. I mean, this idea that I can get certain things in the cafe, but I can't get them on the patient menu. I think we're going to be challenged to sort of merge those together and have that be more uh, in sync, but it's got to be branded and marketed well, it's not just a matter of being able to, to go down uh, there. And so how do you create a, a dining experience that in fact does that? That's how kind of we, we look at it as creating that dining experience, whether it's service, food, or the environment in which it's consumed and how can we best maximize that, whether it's patient dining, catering, or retail. So piggybacking on what you just said, Dan, um, so in order to achieve that vision, um, do you see any new design elements that you would need for that? Or, you know, kind of new design elements do you see in healthcare food service? Um, between patients and, you know, I'm already hearing a, a blended approach. I think blended approaches, but I, th I think almost plug and play is, you know, we talk about that with computers. I, I think we're gonna get even more to that. We've done some of that with some back of the house things, uh, you know, particularly under hoods. Uh, but we're going to get more challenged to, to be able to to do that even more than what we're we're doing. Um, I know that for us, it's going to have to be all electric um, or steam. I don't see gas equipment in our future um, long term. Uh, the, the the new hospital we're designing, just like Jill's, it's you know about a 2030, you know go live. There's no way we're going to be able to do gas and meet all of our energy use intensity uh, goals. So looking at more versatile equipment that may or may not require a hood, stuff that is electric, um, but does have that versatility will certainly be at the top uh, of our list in addition to looking at, you know, water conservation and other things uh, as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, comes to our last question. Um, and then um, anything else uh, you might want to add and then we'll go to questions. Uh, Joe, this last question is for you. Uh, if you were to have a new food service, I know Dan is planning on a couple of them. Um, what food service equipment um, do you desire in your new food service environment that you currently don't have? And what are the most important features and benefits of that equipment? Well, for us, we're, we're certainly starting the planning stages for our new hospital, which will of course have a new kitchen. And in that, similar to what Dan was saying, we'll, we'll be looking at more of uh, the type of menu that can cross both retail and patients. So 
something, a uh, piece of, of equipment that can be very versatile and used in both areas. Um, we're always looking for durable equipment. Sometimes we are uh, given pieces that just don't last very long. And it, it might be that in a, a smaller environment where there aren't as, it isn't getting as much use, um, that it can last a while, but um, our staff know how to bang up a piece of equipment pretty fast if they can. <laughs> so um, that's always important for us. Also, um, ease of cleaning. So our staff are required to clean equipment every day. And if it's too complicated or takes too much time, it's probably not something that we're going to look into uh, too much because you know we are limited on staffing and our, our budget for staffing. And so we can't spend a ton of time cleaning um, intricate pieces of equipment. Um, making sure that it's right size for the facility. Uh, there have been times where we've been uh, asked to look at pieces of equipment that are either too small for our facility or a bit of an overkill, which might use resources that aren't necessary. So uh, making sure that they're water efficient. Like Dan said, we're going to be looking at electric, not so much gas in the future. And um, for us in California, uh, having the ability to seismically anchor all of our equipment because that is a requirement. And in the, we've had situations where we have um, giant uh, anchor feet for pieces of equipment that collect a lot of grease and dirt and are really hard to clean and our staff are tripping over them. And so just keeping that in mind when you are planning how a piece of equipment is going to be anchored in a kitchen in California or a hospital kitchen in California, that's something that's important to us as well. Very valuable information. Dan, anything to add? Well, I think anything that um, allows us to um, re reduce waste, I think we're going to be pushed really hard to go back to reusables and a lot of healthcare food service operations due to the high cost of labor are, are have gone to a lot of disposables. And I think we're gonna get pushed back. Uh, Jill and I, again, work for the University of California. We have some goals on uh, switching back to either compostable or reusable or silverware, re re reduction, uh, reduction or elimination of single use plastics like bottles and things like that, that are going to be uh, really, really hard to meet. Um, our, it'll be interesting to see how budgets shake out uh, you know, with um, availability of capital to do some overall replacement and, and repairs and some of that sort of stuff. Repairs are easy. It's the replacement stuff that gets a little bit more challenging. True. All right, well, that concludes all questions. And um, Ryan, do we have a lot of questions? Do you wanna get started with the Q&A? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have had some Nice questions coming through the chat. Want to encourage everybody to, uh, you know, reach out or build upon these questions. Uh, Please take advantage. That's right. Uh, we're very fortunate to have subject matter experts. So a question from the group. How has your capital budget been affected for replacement of equipment that is at its end of its lifetime? Go right to the dollars. Yeah, so I, I think part of it depends on how does the organization do capital. So most of our capital dollars go to into a big pot and then we have to fight for them. So if it's a, a fix at end of life, uh, there's a, a different pot to go get that. That's not as hard. The, the bigger task is that they've basically frozen uh, a lot of capital and, and are reprioritizing to go in front of a big committee. So our new equipment asks if they're rather substantial, um, have to go sort of fight for those dollars. So, so far, if it's break fix and it's essential, um, but we are being asked, oh, do you really need it? Can it wait? You know, things like that. If, if it's um, not essential, that it absolutely be replaced. Great. Jill? Yeah. Um, for us, we, we've actually been in this situation recently where we had um, two of our combi ovens go down. And, you know, one went down and we were working on trying to get a replacement for the first one. And um, while we were waiting on that, that the other one went down. So <laughs> it's been a little bit tricky. Um, it certainly didn't go into our normal capital budget. It ended up in emergency capital. Uh, in situations like that, you don't have a choice. It's 
do we want to feed patients or not? Um, so we were able to get one replaced and we're holding on the other one for a little while. Um, similar situation with our dish machine. We were in the progress of um, putting together a plan to replace the entire dish machine. And we had started on this last year. And when COVID hit, all of our capital expenses went into a well scrutinized list and that was pushed down to the bottom for the time being. Um, but again, as we continue to have issues with it, they have to look at, is it gonna cost us more to continue to try and fix this or should we just put it in and, and get it replaced? Um, as of right now, they're looking at refurbishing versus uh, buying new. So they are looking at other options and not completely taking us off the list, but um, it's definitely scrutinized a little bit more than maybe it has in the past. Mm -hmm. I think anything that equipment manufacturers can do to help operators sort of work through those decisions, you know, what's the total cost of ownership for a piece of equipment, including repair, preventive maintenance, et cetera. Um, for replace versus repair, you know, are there lease options somewhere in there where therefore it's not a capital expenditure for us, but we still might be able to uh, acquire it. And so what are those terms and conditions and how can we get creative on getting uh, the, the solution in there, even if it's not coming through the traditional capital process? Wonderful. Um, so we have, we have another question here and You'll have to pardon me as I read through it. What has been OSHPD's and CDPH's involvement uh, as far as repurposing stations, adding the partition barriers for separation? Are there any particular requirements above what you typically see in a food service establishment? I don't know if either of you could speak to that question. I uh, probably both can. So uh, OSHPOD, as we call it, is a unique state entity. It basically triples the cost and triples the time it takes to do any type of major modification because we have to show to the state in a California hospital how we're going to seismically anchor it to uh, the floor, the ceiling, the wall, whatever the particular uh, scenario might be. For doing simple things like uh, plastic partitions and stuff like that, it actually doesn't trigger OSHPOD. And uh, CDPH has got other things to worry about during the pandemic and they're not likely to necessarily be spending time uh, looking at those types of things. In fact, they very clearly prioritize other uh, more central activities in California rather than doing that. They have not given us really any dispensation once the emergency order uh, has been sort of concluded uh, on, on doing things faster. So we're still having to go through the traditional process of showing Oshpod, you know, what are the drawings? How are they seismically braced? How are the MEPs and the electrical drawings, you know, me meshing up with everything? Um, so they've been good to work with, uh, especially when we're trying to build a kitchen in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but not not a lot of leeway, per, you know, per se, on on getting stuff done. We we generally get good in California at figuring out what's going to trigger an Oshpod review and what's not, and do everything possible to not have it trigger. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jill, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think you know with. CDPH, as Dan said, they've been involved in other things right now and focus their energy and attention on other areas. So we haven't seen them at all, really. Um, if they have certain requirements, they'll share those with us, uh, but they haven't even come into the hospital all that much um, unless there are you know, complaints or other things coming from patients. But um, same thing you know, with Oshpod, we're, we're trying to just repurpose equipment we already have. Um, if we're moving things, we try to make sure we're moving it to an area where it wouldn't need to be anchored. So maybe it's a mobile piece of equipment. Um, for instance, with the combi ovens, we were looking at one model that wouldn't fit in the same space um, that we had the old oven in. So rather than purchase that one, which would require the addition of Oshpod coming in and um, just the expense with that alone, would you know put us out of our budget so um, we found something that will still fit in the same footprint and wouldn't require that additional site visit. I would also add I would recommend that again the equipment manufacturers if you want to do business at least in California particularly in hospitals maybe give some consideration to how you recommend your equipment being seismically braced. Um, we get a lot of pushback for example on putting things on casters they want to do flange feet instead because it's easier to do the structural 
uh, bracing detail. So if you if you can come up with recommendations, because some a lot of times in my experience, the structural engineers, with all due respect to them, they aren't foodies. They don't run kitchens. They just come up with a way to get it done, which may fly in the face of basic cleaning and sanitation, and then cost us a lot of money just to unbolt things. So I can just go back there and do basic cleaning uh, behind this. So looking at more versatile, quick connect uh, tether, quick, quick connect feet, you know, that, that roll in um, would, would always be something to think about. Great. Great. So thank you. So I have a question, um, and this is somewhat self-serving, you know, brought to you by All Your Refrigeration North America, and it could backfire, but the topic of our last culinary conversation was on blast chillers, blast chillers and blast freezers, and we've, we've seen an increase in sales on our end in this category during the pandemic, and I'm curious as to, you know, on, on your side in the healthcare world, have you seen an increased demand uh, as it relates to blast chilling, be it for food safety, for supply chain issues, uh, for, for serving larger amounts of food? Uh, is, is that a relevant uh, conversation that we could touch on today? Sure. I, I mean, for us, it's an essential piece of pretty much any kitchen uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I, I do think that people still need a lot of education on the food safety standards for cooling. Um, we've made them a little bit more confusing on recent years. And so how can we easily do that through either digital readouts or just kind of educating people a lot more? Probably the biggest thing is about food recovery. Um, there will be some new laws going into effect in California, which we will mandate that we will need to rec recover 20% of our edible food. And we can have a wonderful conversation some other time about what cons constitutes edible and what constitutes recovery. <laughs> uh, we're actually working with the Food Recovery Service right now. But in order to be able to appropriately use that, we do want to put it through the blast chiller, even if we're going to hand it off to the community for the, for the greater good. And, and, and again, this is a state law affecting every large food service outlet in California, Senate Bill 1383, if you're interested. Um, it's one of the leading pieces of legislation in the country about food recovery to try to address some of the inequities in, in our society. So I think the blast chiller in particular is an essential piece to be able to help meet some of those new mandates. Great. Yeah, I think um, there probably has been an increase, maybe not necessarily in healthcare, but in possibly retail areas, maybe colleges and universities where they're not preparing food and serving it right away, where they would have in the, in the past. Um, so they're probably looking at other ways of still making the food, but then safely being able to store it before serving it. And so um, I haven't seen much of an increase or a, a need or demand in, in healthcare with you know our hospitals. But um, then again, we both have blast chillers. So, and we use them all the time. Um, so I think it's just, other areas are looking for um, new ways to still be able to produce their food and, and get it out to the masses, whoever that might be. Wonderful. We're always looking for creative commissary ways. We've kind of got some interesting small scale commissary ops that we're hoping to pop up that can support our little system uh, and get some economies of scale. As we really try to look at our space utilization particularly if catering is not coming back anytime soon, I, you know, I need to jump in on a, a blast show would be a key part of that. Great. Great. Yeah. I had to do it. I had to throw that out That's there. Fine. That's fine. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, I had a question here in the chat and um, it also, it, it, it went along with some curiosity. I had, this is kind of a two part question. Uh, they're, they're asking about uh, the Rome, the, the ramen robot, pardon me. And uh, robotics in itself, you know, could be a whole nother topic that, you know, we've considered here for in a future episode of Culinary Conversations. But the, the question asks, you know, is the ramen robot producing bowls uh, back of the house or is it more guest facing? And, and that could, you know, pose issues in these modern times. So curious about that, whether it's a showpiece or if it's just uh, back of the house. And then also, Dan, are you using any particular equipment to assist with packaging meals or is it all hand packed? Um, so that's the first question. Second question first, we're, we're doing a lot of hand pack. Again, um, we are trying to use non-plastic packaging as much as humanly 
possible. So uh, I, don't, I haven't seen a ton on the market yet to do compostable packaging. I think there's a wonderful opportunity for plastic like compostable items, which in itself has a whole different conversation with your waste hauler and presumes that you in fact have composting in your local jurisdiction, which is another uh, area. So we, we have that in California, we have that in San Francisco. Uh, um, it's not ubiquitous in California, believe it or not, it is in San Francisco. Uh, but we are trying to work through a lot of that. So the ramen robot is really more about extension of, of our ability to be able to provide something all the time. And so the, the partnership with the company, they will actually come in, they are flash frozen, sort of like a base ro ramen and it is reconstituted in about 45 seconds. This is not a brand new company to the market. They've been there. There's, they actually had it in a very large mall in the city of San Francisco. We were able to go try it and see the user experience. But the kind of idea is at three o'clock in the morning, what types of healthy uh, you know, options or options that people want and a nice bowl of ramen would go a long way uh, for us. And they've shown some uh, potential in using some other products in, in their model too. So because it's commercially manufactured and stocked and stored, the, the risk is very low and it becomes a, basically a, a contactless point of entry. Uh, they, this company uh, and many other companies, you see this with many self-service solutions are now doing uh, apps to basically order what you want or program how you want your soda or whatever and do it in the app so you don't actually have to touch the machine that is in fact dispensing your food or beverage. And, and this particular company is, is doing some of that as well. And we're looking for some of this on, on lockers. Uh, food lockers are in our future. Uh, I think the question is what, what kind? And there are, you know, the, the, we've had a lot of internal conversations about, you know, should the pickup locker just be ambient? You see some restaurants just putting out a big shelf and it's, it's not heated, you know, but does that need to be different in a, in a healthcare in, environment because there might be other reasons where they may not be able to come down? Well, what happens when half the, the, the meal order is, you know, a beverage which shouldn't be heated, but then the other part needs to be, you know, kept hot. So we're looking more at ambient pass-through cases uh, in ours. In some cases, we're going to do some front-loaded ones uh, as well, and we'll, we'll see how that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that you're speaking to now, robotics, cabinets, you know, we're seeing that evaluated very heavily on on the national chain account side too. You know, people are trying to figure out the best ways to do pickup, delivery, Grubhub, you know, or dash, whatever. And, uh, you know, what are the best ways to be able to maintain the integrity of the ingredients or the dish prepared and serve it as intended, uh, but not be able to serve it right away. Uh, so very interesting on that front. Um, I don't know, Jill, if, if you wanted to speak to, to packing uh, in any capacity, uh, additional maybe novel equipment that um, you've considered um, you know, in this capacity. Um, for us, um, we haven't really considered any novel equipment at this time. Dan's usually the one that starts it and shares it with the rest of us. <laughs> um, but uh, for um, packaging, we do self-pack. Um, we're kind of unique because we're in a situation in California where um, none of our waste haulers uh, compost, at least not the products that are available to us. So um, the compostable products that are out there um, are great in some areas. For us, it just doesn't work because you know we're spending money on a product that unfortunately isn't going to be broken down the way it was intended. Um, so we're actually looking more at reusable and what we can do with that, especially right now. I mean, obviously we use reusable for all of our patients. Um, we're not using it for staff, but it is something that we're starting to look into more since our retail business is down. Uh, we don't have quite as many people that we'd have to worry about um, the use of reusables with. Uh, so this might be a good time for us to implement something like that and see how it works and if it's something we can continue to use moving forward. I mean, the cost of compostable so far, even in San Francisco where we do have composting is very prohibitive. And so we're actually doing cost benefit analysis on compostable versus reusable because we think that it's gonna pencil out to be about the same, uh, maybe even less with reusable. So if there's some, you know, innovations around that. And then we're also looking at just sort of, you know, how can we automate the dish room and some other things along those lines. We've got some of that on our drawing board 
to see how we can take some of those mundane tasks. At the same time, we actually sort in our dish room, uh, landfill recycle compost. So how, how do we accomplish that with a robot and whatever? So we're working through some of those issues, although we're looking more towards our new facilities as opposed to retrofitting our existing ones.